All right, welcome everyone. Welcome Sergey. Welcome Brian. Uh, so excited to be here. So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Tanwa Pontip. I am the blockchain technical advisor of SCB 10X. And joining me today, I would rather have them introduce themselves. Let's start with you, Sergey. Hey guys, uh, great to be here. Uh, I'm Sergey. I'm co-founder of Axler. Um, so yeah. All right, uh, and up next, Brian. Yeah, hi, Brian, uh, co-founder, CEO of Layer Zero Labs. All right. Um, so typically people would go into like, oh, why did you get into Web3 in the first place, blah, 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 and all that. But I find the two technologies that we have over here super exciting. So we're just going to go right ahead and talk about that. Let's start with you first, uh, Sergey. Um, for Axila, uh, so Axila, you call yourself the cross-chain overlay network, right? Uh, with uh, proof of stake building into it. So can you dive deeper into why that is important in the space and what problems or barriers were you trying to solve when you started Axila? Sure, yeah. I mean, on the high level, um, you know, with Axler, we're trying to solve the problem of uh, secure communication across different blockchains, right? You have all these different blockchains that have activity, you know, from DeFi to users, NFTs, and so on and so forth, right? And there's, they're all fragmented, right? So the connectivity between them has been pretty sparse. You know, you see a lot of attacks in the space whenever there is any type of connectivity or bridging technology between them. So it's a, so it's a pretty hard problem, right? And so what Axel is trying to do is really work on kind of secure infrastructure, right? And network and a set of protocols that we can use to securely connect all these different blockchains uh, to enable users to interact with um, any asset on any blockchain with any application with one click, right? So uh, kind of the very core of it is a decentralized proof of stake protocol that powers all this activity and, uh, you know, used to interact and connect uh, across all these different ecosystems. Okay. Uh... Thank you. Uh, for for layer zero, though, Brian, uh, you call yourself the omni-chain interoperability protocol. Um, can you dive deeper into the difference between what you call an omni-chain solution and cross-chain solution? And you also take a very different approach when it comes to um, securing your solution by not using proof of stake. Uh, can you dive into your uh, thought and your analysis on that? Yeah, so the, the way I framed it myself was like cross-chain was bi-directional, right? Two, two pathways you're going across. Uh, it can be unidirectional as well, but that was cross-chain. Multi-chain was, you know, Ethereum tied to four other chains, but none of those chains basically tied to each other. And Omnichain was just pure internet interconnectivity between all of them, right? Like that was the main thing is you should have the same experience uh, between all connected pathways, whereas before you had most bridges, which would have singular pathways inwards or out of, you know, let's say Ethereum to, to some of these others. Um, it was very hard to route in any other direction or do anything that was like reasonably useful. Um, and I think in like the underlying architecture behind Layer Zero was really more of sort of the premise that we we thought that you always like, you will never be able to scale through one single system was our base, basically core thesis. A bunch of people had tried sort of this hub and spoke model before, and we thought that had been tied sort of time and time and time again, and never really got economic security past a billion, $2 billion, maybe somewhere around there, roughly, maybe maybe a little bit more than that, but not, not too much more, right? And that it was very clear that you're gonna need to be able to secure hundreds of billions of dollars. And basically the premise was that to do that, you need to have, uh, basically ability to sort of like shard risk or create pathways and that when you have certain applications, whether that be groups uh, like, you know, whatever largest application in the world, they're going to have different sort of security needs and different sets of parameterization than sort of the smallest application in the world. They may be willing to default to like some, some subset or like one singular set of parameterization. So like the, the real premise was like, how do you facilitate all of that and still find a way to sort of scale on security side. So uh, at like a very, very high level, that was sort of the approach uh, was that we did not think the existing approach would, would ever scale to meet like broad demand. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw a little, a little wrench into this conversation here. So Brian, uh, what do you describe as hop and spoke model is exactly uh, to my understanding what Axela is doing, right? So, um, so what is your trade off here compared to Axela? Like, or what are you giving up uh, by not using uh, an external 
validating blockchain like actual solution. Yeah, sure. So, uh, and obviously Sergey can, can give his own take on this as well. But like, mm -hmm. premise find out. I'm going. I'm going is, to him next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Uh, you have a chain that sits in the middle, and basically, rather than having this dynamic like n squared. Uh, connections, you're going to have everything flowing to Axelar. Axelar will be the source of truth. You're going to run like clients for everything. Axelar Axel, uh, validator set sort of controls that source of truth. And then it writes something out to each other chain, right? Um, and so that is the, the classic sort of hub and spoke model. And so the model is you have this uh, delegated sort of proof of stake system with quadratic staking. And so all the validators stake. There's some measure of like economic security within that of how much is bonded. And you need to be able to corrupt a certain percentage of that basic system uh, to be able to exploit the network, right? So the economic security of that system basically controls the economic security of like what is attached to it. Um, now, a broad premise or original premise was that the downside of that is that if that validator set breaks, everything breaks basically in terms of like pure systemic risk. If, if, if that validator set becomes malicious, it can now effectively arbitrarily write transactions to every application on every single paired blockchain. So if you have contracts that allow minting, you'll be able to mint, you know, infinite or whatever the maximum allow, you know, maybe you can, again, applications themselves can sort of define guardrails, which you see people do now. So maybe you can only mint a certain amount per day or whatever. There, there can be some controls at application level, but whatever the maximum amount of damage you can do, that is what the validator set basically can do. So the premise of layer zero was, again, uh, that basically now you have this spread of oracles and relayers, which each, again, each of these could be their own proof of stake network. Each of these could have their own economic security, but you basically create these sort of like siloed pathways uh, or sort of like sets of risk in there. Now the trade-offs are a couple fold. Uh, one is that it is much, much easier uh, on the Axelar side, as, as far as I understand it, to like spin up to new networks. So they, they, like it's, it's generally more lightweight in general. So I, I think it's quite easy for them to like expand and go to a lot of places. Uh, I think um, on the other side of things, like layer zero has to at scale, eventually have this broad spread of oracles or relayers, right? Like you need to have this to where there is a huge subset, either either large singular sets that are very decentralized in themselves. So you can imagine, you know, one massive proof of stake network uh, playing one of these roles or like many small sub networks doing that. Um, so like that needs to happen over time for, for the vision, like ever to be, uh, to basically play out. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think those are, those are really the big things, right? It's like, mm. are you able to build this massive amount of stake within a singular system and avoid this sort of like tail risk of that system ever being corrupt and, and basically exploiting the external network? Or can you build this sort of like sharded system of small things? But to do that, you need to have like all of the, all of the nodes spread out to be able to create these sort of like shards. And will they not end up sort of aggregating to a few pathways? And so there, there's a world where like the parameterizations that get used in production are five or 10 common parameterizations, um, which still is like, okay, you still have like 10 kind of smaller shards. Um, hmm. but it's not hundreds or thousands or something that would be in an ideal state. So there's, there's a couple of trade-offs there, uh, but I think we're pretty comfortable hmm. with our approach. All right. Uh, let's go back to Sergey over here. And same question to you. Um, what can you do that uh, you think could be done on Axula better than could be done on layer zero or, or more faster anyway? And what are the trades off that you are giving up by using your current design? Yeah, I mean, I guess like, yeah, let me address a couple of different points. So when it comes to, you know, first of all, I think uh, kind of a cross chain, right? I think like Brian defined it as sort of pairwise. I mean, I do think there's like, you know, the industry is undefined, right? So what, what Brian calls like pairwise, I mean, I would call like many to many, right? So like Axelor is many to many kind of cross chain solution. So you can kind of talk from any chain to any other chain, you know, with one click. Um, so, you know, yeah, not to kind of get down deeper, but I think all those definitions are just uh, kind of different between different projects, right? Um, so that's one thing. Two, when it comes to economic security um, and Axelor itself, look, at the end of the day, you have to have a network or a protocol that can securely process messages, okay? So in Brian's case and layer zero, it's sort of uh, oracles and relayers, and then you are just pushing the problem of constructing a secure oracle and relay network to the end user, right? And I think like, you know, layer zero is run as like, what, two out of three oracles, something like that. 
um, how do you make that decentralized? How do you actually make sure anybody can join and securely validate this network? So that's really the hard problem, right? Um, and so actually kind of a, being a secure and decentralized network from day one actually has those properties, right? Now, going back to the economic security, the bottom line is that security at the network layer, right, um, doesn't, first of all, has to directly tie with the assets that are held, right? I think there is a kind of a belief in the proof of stake ecosystem that like things like validators have something at stake and what they have at stake has to be greater than the economic security of what they secure. The reality is that for most proof of stake chains, that's completely false, right? In every proof of stake chain, validator has to bond you know, certain amount of money, which far is lower than anything that the, that the security, uh, than the chain uh, values itself, right? So how do you get security? You get security through decentralization, right? You get security because validators run decentralized software stacks that are deployed across all kinds of different nodes, and they have incentives to not collude the system because they have something at stake. What is at stake? It could be some economic security, it could be your reputation, it could be because somebody's paying you, right, to run that validator and you provide in the service. And so all those properties can be instantiated when you actually have a decentralized network, right? If you want to have more economic security, you can always do that, right? So for instance, in Cosmos, there is a you know pretty well-known concept of interchain security, right? And we're talking about mesh security where one chain can borrow and lend economic security to other chains, right? So Axel protects a lot of value between, you know, Osmosis or Uniswap or, you know, DYDX, whatever that is, we can actually take some security of those applications, put it on Axela, put it at the stake of the validator and vice versa, right? So the stake of Axela can be used to secure um, all those different um, blockchains, right? And so that's what really, I think, a trend, a general trend that we're starting to see is where chains on network individually that are decentralized, that can actually talk to one another, start sharing and co-owning the security model, which I think, you know, is quite interesting. And so all these economic uh, kind of security questions go, go out of the way. Um, so, yeah, and uh, I guess the final point is it, when it comes to, you know, an attack surface, right? Whenever you're talking about an attack surface of a network, um, you want to start with a core that's as strong as possible, and you want to add on top of it and supplement on top of it, right? That's how basics of security work. And so Axelab having like the strong core and a decentralized core gives you those default configurations that you could always create, right? It gives you all the security that you need. You can always add additional security on top of it if you want, right? If you want to have, you know, an extra relayer set of protections or, you know, extra verification server before executing a transaction, rate limits, and so on and so forth, you can all do all those things, right? But for 99% of developers or application use cases, the reality is that they don't know how to think about security, right? We see in attacks all the time in the space, even from the experts that are building in it, right? So then how do you actually provide the core and the strong, you know, baseline that everybody can start with is I think that's what we've, we've tried to do, you know, and, and it is because it is hard, the hard problem, right? It is a problem that actually has to be solved. Can, all right. Can I, can I ask two quick questions? Um, sure. Very quickly, though, because we want to move on to the applications of the uh, of the. Tool. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, just, just one thing that you had said was was that like decentralization inherently buys security or like supply security, but like isn't like if you take the model of like Ethereum or any any of the sort of like prior large layer ones, they, they sort of take like the orthogonal stance to that. Like I, I would say that like Flashbots is actually a perfect example of like it being almost the, the total opposite, right? Of like this, this uh, collection of miners who are literally colluding to like extract the maximum value from the network and capture MEV. And there was like miners historically have like, you know, for a very long time, the Ethereum miners spent like six months when Edward was proposing this uh, to literally like reorg the chain for like large arbitrage opportunities, right? Like there's this world where uh, it had always kind of been the stance that like pure economic security, like is everything. You should always expect the miners in aggregate or the validators in aggregate to like act in their own best interest. And you cannot expect them to kind of like be good actors. So like, do you believe that like decentralization actually provides that versus like needing the underlying economic security sort of to be tied in? So that was, that was one question. And then the other question was just like, uh, I, I know you're saying you can eventually do like interchange security with other stuff. Is, is there concern 
that the primary staking unit right now within Axelar is like the, the underlying token, given, given like FTT and like everything else that happened, right? Like, like, are you guys opening up? Will you be staking stables? Will you be staking other stuff? Like, um, like is that intended to be a meaningful part of the staking or will it remain to be like the, the, the token of the protocol itself, which has all, you know, the negative convexity that sort of we saw? Yeah, I guess like first question, not, not sure I understand. So are you arguing that like centralized protocols are better because decentralized protocols have incentives to kind of misbehave in the system or like what do you No, asking? I'm arguing that decentralization and security and or trust are different, right? You can be decentralized, you can have a thousand nodes, but like an upgradable contract and then that you're basically permission to the admin keys. You can have a thousand nodes, but uh, basically have them have so low aggregate economic security that like it makes sense for them to collude, to do things like extract MEV, to do things like reorg the underlying chain because then extract more value at it. Like at the end of the day, the consensus layer like is whatever they agree that it is, right? Like uh, the consensus layer is the consensus of the validator nodes and they should do what is in their I, most let me aggregate leave, let me... net benefit. Let me rephrase that question a little bit. I think what you're trying to say, Brian, is, uh, I, I think is that to get security, there's a lot of moving parts. We have consensus, we have economic incentives, you have you know security. Um, and I think your question is that how does Axela guarantee or ensure the users that you can align all of these factors together to make sure that your solution is secure? Is that about right? Yeah, it was more sort of specifically said, like, you don't need to have, you know, you don't, it's, everyone talks about economic security and the validator sets and that, like, all these other chains don't have that. But, you know, what you do is you get decentralization. My, my question is, mm -hmm. is decentralization enough? Does that really buy you security? Because of course not. There's a lot of, of not, cases. Right? That, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I mean, look, I never said decentralization enough. What I said is that you have to start with a strong core that can actually be used to build secure system. And having a decentralized protocol allows you to have such a core for very technical reasons. Reason number one, you can have a diverse software deployment off your software stack, right? So meaning that every validator has their own deployment. You know, it's not just running like two out of three, like Oracle or anything else that like you decide how it gets deployed. It's actually every validator makes a decision how to secure their own validator, how to protect their own keys in order to participate in this protocol. And an open membership and an open participation in this protocol is one of the premises you have to have to guarantee security, right? Similarly, as we've seen over and over in the ecosystem and in the blockchain and Web3, decentralization and open protocols allow you to actually build kind of systems that are trustworthy, right? And have trust assumptions that are all exposed to everybody that I can see, right? And understand and verify. You know, everything we've seen like from, you know, FTX, right, like collapse and everything is because those systems are closed. Those systems have kind of a nobody knows what's going on behind the scenes. Nobody can understand how to even think about the security of those systems. Right. Um, whereas, you know, even like in the case of a terror collapse or something, OK, it was collapsed. Right. But I don't think anybody ever said that, you know, we didn't know about those things. It's the opposite that people came out and they said look like we actually pointed out these issues, like because the code, yes, maybe, you know, um, they were not addressed on time and so on and so forth. But I think the kind of a, the, you know, um, the transparency of this protocol is what allows you to build trust and build security in the long term, right? Because without it, I think we're just, you know, we're back to retrofitting kind of Web2 solutions with, the, you know, centralized kind of databases in the middle. And, uh, you know, you ask yourself, how do I make it secure and so on and so forth. And I think we're just, you know, kind of a flipping the cards back and forth. Um, on that, so um, so yeah, I think it's uh, you know it's it's pretty important to start with a core that that has the capabilities of being you know secure and, and decentralized in the long term and open and transparent. Um, by no means it's sufficient, right? Like I think security is a always I say it's a sort of a multi-dimensional problem that has binary outcomes, right? <laughs> Did you get hacked or not at the end of the day, right? That's what everybody will care about. How do you get to that? You know, it's kind of complicated business, right? And I think you know everybody can take like a different path to get there and you know hopefully i think as an industry we'll actually um we'll actually get there but right now you know it is a hard problem that i think everybody's fighting on yeah all right uh so while the talk about the infrastructure layer or or how the two different solutions approach similar problem is very interesting another side that is very interesting to me as well is the applications of your solutions 
Um, so what are some of the current and future use cases for your projects? And uh, what are some of the projects that you see that are either happening right now or will happen in the future that will be more natural to be developed using your solution compared to the other solution? Uh, so uh, let's start with you, Brian. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you talk about adoption, right? Like, what is what is it like? What is actually interesting? I think there's a couple of verticals there that like people clearly fall into right now, whether it's whether it's DeFi or whether it's NFT and gaming or whatever it is. Like, what we actually measure on our end for for what we think is like meaningful on adoption side is number of contracts on testnet, number of contracts who have migrated mainnet, overall number of messages, um, and then like market share of messages per day and volume pa passed per day, right? So we're at like we launched seven months ago. Uh, we're up to 15,000 plus contracts on testnet, 1,500 contracts on mainnet. Uh, we have about a billion and a half in external TVL outside of Stargate. And then we have Stargate, which obviously we put out ourselves. Um, we are doing a couple billion dollars a month in overall transactional volume on the network on pace for about 450,000 messages this month, just crossed a million messages overall. Um, and I think there's like tons, tons, tons of cool things in there. Like, I think the biggest thing for any of us building is like, how does it actually get used? What is, what is real adoption actually meaningfully look like? And so I, I think seeing like crossing the billion dollar of external TVL, like applications who just came and built on us and accrued that and are, are having massive success on their own. Super interesting. Seeing these external applications having, you know, hundreds of thousands of messages a month, super interesting. Uh, watching Stargate, um, you know, layers are just all time high in messages. Stargate hit basically all, all, all time high in messages and almost all time high in volume. Um, it's, it's been really cool. So I think generally, like, I care most about just applications building, whatever that is, whether it's NFT and gaming side, whether it's DeFi side, I think there's a ton of things that we think are super interesting. But it's not really my job to judge what is what is most interesting, what is best, et cetera. It's my job to kind of build the most extensible primitive and make the easiest interface for people to build on top of. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Sergey. Same question. Uh, what are applications that you think are interesting that are right now or coming? And which kind, what kind of applications would be more natural to be built on Axilla? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think pretty similar, right? Um, I think uh, can answer that the kind of a Brian had. Um, I think overall, if you take a step back and take a look at the applications in the ecosystem that have product market fit, there is value for having them being, you know, uh, chain agnostic, right? Or kind of cross chain enabled. So everything from, you know, DeFi, NFTs, right? Wallets, um, you know, stable coins and so on and so forth. I think that's where we see a lot of, uh, you know, at least early demand, right? So why does it why does it help to be kind of chain agnostic? Because you have ability to tap into the users and liquidity of all these different ecosystems, right? So we know that a DEX that has, you know, 10 times more volume is going to have lower slippage, right? We know that the DEX that has, you know, um, better kind of a, a liquidity unification properties will have lower fees for the users at the end of the day, right? That's the only way to make your product kind of competitor. And so I think that's where we've seen, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, at least like early uh, types of use cases is kind of rewriting the whole Web3 stack to be chain agnostic. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. So according to a lot of report uh, in, in the past year or two, some of the most damaging exploits in DeFi have come from cross-chain bridges solutions. Um, so what are your thoughts on that, uh, seeing how you are in that space? Like what are the pros and cons of like having bridges at all? And what can we do to improve uh, the security of a bridge solution? Uh, let's go with uh, Brian first. Yeah, so I mean, I think they're all, they're all in a bunch of different buckets, right? There's a bunch of the hacks were just plain and simple, like smart contract bugs, right? You write bad code on chain, you're going to get wrecked. Like that's just the nature of the space, right? Um, so many of them were, were purely just smart contract mistakes. Some of them, other, you know, wormhole had uh, the same initialization bug twice. Uh, one, uh, you know, they ended up paying out a ten million dollar bug bounty and then like having it again. So like a lot of this is just like pure like basic just writing good code and that's that's like baseline everybody needs to do that and then i think you see things that are like 
more interesting. Poly network hack was basically, you know, this, this hacker sort of stuffing a clever set of bytes to be able to like bypass and make himself the validator. You had things like, I mean, Nomad was really just more operational security than anything, right? They, they had like uh, put out code, had a single audit, um, came back with 40 issues, basically just fixed the issues and like pushed it into production. And like, this is one of the things we've been positioning from the very beginning is basically like, any system with upgradable contracts is like an existential risk to everything that builds on top of it. Like if you have the ability, so in the Nomad case, like they had the ability to, to change the underlying code and validation method that like everybody built on top of it or everybody using anything on top of that uses. And like, it doesn't matter what cool or fancy things you have up here. Like if you have a permissioned set where you can change the underlying parameterization or validation library or the way that applications on top handle everything, uh, then basically that is your security. It's basically that set of admin keys, right? And then you had your own admin key hacks. When you look at Axie Ronin, when you look at Harmony, et cetera, right? So I, I think everything falls in different buckets. I think like what we have taken from all of this is basically a couple of things. Like one, um, nothing is more important than security. Like, yes, moving fast is great, but like security has to come first because just like tail risk matters more than anything else. Like you have to minimize that. So Everything that we do is basically one to three internal audits, two to four external audits. I think we've spent probably the most in the world on audits this year. Like by the end of the year, we'll be $5 million a year to date on audits. Um, so like we have multiple auditors on retainer. We, every single thing goes through multiple passes of audits. Uh, the entire system is constructed in such a way that we have no ability uh, basically for any application who wants to opt into like a specific validation library, we cannot change their, their parameterization, period. Like they set their block comps, they set their validation library, they set all of this. So defaults for people who don't want to care about it or don't want to think about it. Um, but like at its core, nobody needs to opt into that. And I think like everybody needs to give applications like that level of optionality. Uh, because I think again, like nobody should have to trust us as like the technology layer. Nobody should need to like, trust that we won't do anything malicious, trust that we won't push bad code. Like that is not something uh, that should exist today at the technology layer. That's just not how things should be built. And so I think like, it just comes down to like attention to detail and rigor and like having good security, like operational security and like everything, every piece of code that goes out that touches anything needs to go through that. And then you need to protect against yourself, consider yourself a bad actor and give applications the ability basically to protect against you, against the team, against the protocol itself, doing anything that is net malicious to the applications above. Okay, thank you, Brian. Sergey? Um, I guess, so, sorry, just like a quick question maybe for Brian. So Brian, like you had, you guys had an Oracle, right? With uh what is it, like FTX Polygon, right? And like, I think Sequoia. And so now FTX is sort of, you know, ha kind of has been hacked and you guys are saying your contracts are not upgradable. So how are you dealing with these types of issues? Yeah, so every, so layer zero from its start, right? The two main things that we cared about when we're building the protocol. First is like, we're building a protocol, not a service. It's not a service people opt into. It's a protocol. Yeah, from day one, contracts are immutable. Uh, Oracle relayers, every participation on the validator side, completely open and permissionless. Anybody can run that. Axelar itself basically could play the role of, of relayer or Oracle, the Axelar network within layer zero right now, right? Uh, li like literally anybody can do it. There's nothing on our end. Um, and so like from day one, open and permissionless. Uh, and like, we think that was like default. Like you have to be able to do that. And second was like, if we were maximally malicious. So first is like, if we disappeared from the face of the earth today, if layers are walked away and never like if our team, our office blew up, we all disappeared, whatever happened, like layer zero will exist as a protocol until the end of time or until Ethereum makes breaking changes. Second is if we wanted to be maximally malicious, if our only goal was to harm applications built on top of us, every application has to have the ability to basically opt out of that. So when you ask about like oracles on top of it. So originally there was a TSS of, uh, Sequoia, Polygon, FTX, there are now seven oracles on board. Basically every major oracle in the world, every every you know large oracle basically is participating in this on top of things like um, you know, a bunch of MPC compute networks, individual applications, and then like very large node provider groups. So uh, you know, all of this is already, but like open and permissionless from day one. Uh, right now you can feel free to go spin up an oracle uh, if you want to participate. So yeah. But I guess in this particular case, so FTX is gone. So to actually even switch to a different Oracle, that means somebody has to have actually like upgradable contracts, right? Um, because otherwise, what do you do, right? Like, uh, or what do you what do you expect like people to do right now that relied on that? 
on that, uh, you know, two out of three Oracle. Uh, yeah. Okay. So every application, basically there, there are two ways you can do it. Applications themselves define uh, what they want to set for Oracle, for Relayer, for basically all of this. So they have the ability to basically sunset their own ability to change that, to do anything. They have the ability to opt into defaults. They have the ability to do whatever. So it really depends on two, what the application is opting to do and what the defaults of the network are currently set at. Um, and so that, that basically is a construct, but it was two out of three anyway. So like there are still two keys that are actively going through. Um, yeah. All right, Sergey, uh, back to the original question. Uh, what's your thought on bridge security and um, how would you improve it if you have to? I mean, always, I think <laughs> that's the bottom line, right? I think, you know, uh, the reality is that, you know, no matter what you say, I think, you know, everybody in the interoperability or cross-chain ecosystem right now is trying to figure out how to, how to make this thing secure, right? And it is a kind of combination of having the right design having the right processes, having the right engineering on top of it, right? So, um, you know, we've done everything from things like quadratic voting on the network, various like application, like add-ons, you know, rate limits and so on and so forth. Um, kind of no protocol by default, I think no matter what design you have, right? That you can really uh, mitigate against all kinds of, um, you know, software or engineering vulnerabilities. So you have to have protections in place and you have to have fallbacks in place, right? So I think things like, you know, rate limits, for instance, are incredibly important, right, in these protocols. So that in the worst case, um, you know, you will actually kind of be able to to mitigate the damage, right, of your protocol. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, from our side, we continuously invest in it. So we've done, you know, over 30 audits on the network to date. I think all kinds of security protections are in place. So I kind of encourage people to kind of check out in, um, you know, our documentation. But, um, you know, it is, I would say as an industry, right? Like a question that we're trying to answer, right? As a as an interoperability industry, which, uh, you know, I think where most of the questions are and, uh, you know, kind of the time will show, of course. To, to be clear, rate limits, are you in favor of application layer or technology layer? Like where do you think rate limiting should live? I think application layer, right? Like applications should have an ability to decide uh, what additional security add-ons they need to have, right? Uh, kind of how to deal with messages, how to deal with, <clears throat> Uh, abnormalities in the network layer, right? Uh, things like that. So, so it all comes down to kind of partitioning um, the security across the layers and every layer, you know, having the right uh, validation in place. So at the network layer, you have to do the best to validate the message, right? At the application layer, you have to do the best you can do to validate it, um, a message coming from the, you know, from the validation at the network layer, right? So in the same way as in traditional systems, we have multiple layers of firewalls, right? You have network layer firewall, you have application layer firewall, then you have a browser layer firewall, right? Um, I think the same types of kind of checks um, and security process have to be put in place in the in the interoperability stacks. So you can have the rate limit on both layers, right? The application layer and the technology layer. Or is that- You get, could, or is that I think it gets like a little bit harder. Or is that getting into like censorship territory a little bit? Um, I mean, I don't know about censorship, right? Like you have to really think about, uh, you know, what do applications want, right? Like you could always have this at the network layer where it's configurable by the application to opt in, right? Uh, you know, uh, even though it's processed at the network layer, right? Or you can have it at the application edge at the, you know, at the smart contract, uh, you know, layer itself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it just kind of depends on what the application envisages the, the instantiate. At the network layer, it's harder because a lot of these network layers to be secure, they have to be as agnostic as possible, right, to the messages that they process. Um, and so when you actually start ha start having some of these knowledge about the messages, then kind of the stack just gets a little bit more, you know, complex. It's doable, but, you know, you have to be mindful of that. Okay. All right. Uh, so next question, uh, user experience in blockchain has always been borderline disaster, if you ask me. Um, but instead of talking about user experience from end users, because I have used both Axilla and uh, Layer Zero Stargate protocol, right? And to the end user, the people who use MetaMask, it looks almost the same, right? So I want to ask it from a different perspective, from developer's perspective. Uh, as far as developing for Axilla and developing for Layer Zero, what would be the differences in their developing experiences? What would their like workflow look like? What are the differences? Uh, let's go with uh, Brian first. Yeah, 
Uh, I mean, I, I think everybody like, it's just like when you use any developer tooling, it's a piece of technology like anything else. I think everybody basically tries to make that end-to-end -end experience as, as seamless as possible. That's a mixture of like, of tooling, of, of resources, of the ability to like spin something up easily. Um, I think all of that is a mix. I don't think like it's, you know, at the end of the day, any good technologist, like the underlying language doesn't matter that much. The underlying tools don't really like matter that much, right? Like at the end of the day, it's it's an ends to a mean, um, or means to an end rather, I should say. Uh, but like net differences between the two, I actually, you know, I do, frankly, I don't know that much about like the XLR developer experience. Um, so I, I, I can't answer that like in whole, but I, but I think at the end, like most experiences are going to be relatively similar. It's like, what do you provide the developer on top of that? How easy do you make it? I know one thing we've, we've heard just like over and over again, is basically if you go to the docs and you play and you spin up, like you should be sending messages back and forth across chains, like within 30 minutes of first touching the docs, like from the immediate ability. So like, it should be very, very fast to spin up and get started. And I think that's something we do really, really well. And then I think the ability to do things like gas abstraction, all this other stuff on top that make the experience quite seamless, right? So when you use Stargate, single click from one chain, entire flow basically executed on both sides. It's not something that's Stargate specific, that's something that's built in to every single application on top, including air dropping assets on the other side, including you know all everything that comes with that, that makes the end consumer experience. So like take one bundle and make this composable bundle that to the end user is one transaction. And then you have this layer of abstraction that can get built on top of that. Okay, thank you, Brian. Sergey? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, right, um, the you know the user experience or the developer experience are um, you know it's pretty similar to how coding on a on a single chain. There is a caveat, I think, you know, not specific to Axel but specific to interoperability, is that a developer has to think about asynchronous communications right across different chains, um, and so. You know, especially like a lot of Web3 native developers that, you know, were taught how to code, you know, on a single EVM chain, right, or on Solana, they are only familiar with like synchronous communication. Right? So they don't really know how to think about like fallbacks, you know, and things like that, right, asynchronous uh, patterns. Um, so there's a bit of, a, I think, educational, uh, you know, uh, kind of a curve that I think everybody has to do. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, like, Web2 runs on asynchronous communication, right? So I, when you have Web2 developers that are entering the space and, you know, understanding how to talk across uh, different blockchains uh, through any of these protocols, they're you know, like, yeah, that's sort of, you know, home ground for them, right? Uh, so it's so natural and intuitive how to design patterns and so on and so forth work. I'll say like one probably, um, you know, difference in terms of overall having kind of a blockchain or Axler versus other protocols is that Axelar being a, you know, a blockchain, you can audit everything and you can trace everything on chain itself, right? So every message is, you know, uh, traceable. You can see where it originated. You can see where it's going. You can aggregate statistics so you can index them. You can query them. And having a kind of a, a uniform protocol to do all that gives you, you know, a lot of efficiency for, you know, parsing that data, dealing with the data, right, uh, and building applications in the same way. You know, if you have pairwise kind of a protocols that are connected, uh, you know, A's and B's and B's and C's, you're going to have to aggregate across all of them, right? And you're going to have to put everything together. And then, you know, maybe one is actually, you know, has a decentralized backend. Maybe the other one doesn't have a decentralized backend. So now you're aggregating some, some data that somebody just tells you and some data that's actually, you know, reliably verifiable. So you have to think about, you know, uh, fake data and so on and so forth. So I would say like that's, a, you know, a pretty big difference. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to forward-looking statement a little bit. So it's been quite a challenging year for crypto in general. So how are your how are your projects navigating these challenge in crypto with uh, the price going down, the volume going down, maybe the usage going down as well? Like how are you dealing with this, and what are you looking forward to be building in the in this bear market? I guess. Uh, let's start with Sergey first this time and then go to Brian. Yeah. I mean, I view this, to be honest, like as an opportunity to um, kind of build the, the technology that the next wave of applications should, should be built upon, right? I think the reality is that of the last bull cycle, the conclusion was, you know, there are certain product market, you know, uh, or certain use cases that have product market fits. 
you exit interaction in those products is horrible. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's not something you can go and, you know, uh, uh, take to retail. It's not something you can hope to get, you know, hundreds of millions, you know, users or uh, to, to kind of use. And I think the infrastructure that's been missing could not be built, frankly, in very hyped cycles, right? Because you don't have time to build this infrastructure, right? Um, you know, the comparison that I always give is that, you know, when the internet was built, right, like all these communication protocols and interoperability questions were answered 20 years before a single application used them, right? And we're finding ourselves, you know, fortunately in a very reverse position, right, where, you know, the day you ship the application, uh, you know, it gets used by, you know, hundreds of thousands of users, right, and uh, kind of people interacting with this stuff. And then you, you know, it's kind of on you to make sure you don't ship it too early, right? And have all those checks and balances in place and audits and so on and so forth. Um, but it is, you know, kind of a, um, you know, it's it's great, but it's also dangerous and scary for that reason, right? And for the same reason as we've seen kind of hacks in the space that's been, you know, uh, people kind of get a little bit too impatient, right? And ahead of themselves and, you know, try to uh, get the code out there that maybe it needs a little bit more time to be tested. So... Yeah, so to me, that's an opportunity to kind of build the right technical stacks so that when the applications, you know, are being built for the next cycles and for the next wave of adoption, they have better UX, right? And they have, um, you know, liquidity properties, they have composition properties that could not be offered before, you know, and hopefully that would only continue then extending the user base of all these applications. Otherwise, we're going to be, you know, living in the same bubble of, uh, you know, Web3 users. Okay, great. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, um, this is, you know, going on year number 10 for me in this space. So, like, I, I, I've seen this and lived this many, many times before already. Um, I honestly, like, I don't even think it's that bad relative to, like, prior times. Like, basically, both of us, like, things were, like, dead, dead, dead. Uh, I don't even think we're there yet. So, um, for us, you know, I, I put out a memo right after everything happened. We're, as a, as a company, we're extremely well capitalized. We've got $134 million in cash, basically minimum, like in very worst case, everything, highest salary projections, everything, like seven years uh, runway. Like we have all the time in the world to just build, right? And I think that that really is the intention. So uh, I echo the sentiment that like in, in peak kind of craziness, it's very hard to sit down and just like focus on technology. And I think that's why we actually like, we built the large majority of everything before even coming out of stealth because like it was easier to just do it. We didn't have to have any external conversations. Like we just built. Um, and I, I definitely think like noise is a factor. And so I think it will be nice. I think uh, it is a good time to just sit and like be able to reflect deeply about like how you want things to be structured on like a, like a very, very long term time horizon and basically build towards that. Um, and so for our end, like, yeah, I don't know. Business as usual for the most part. Uh, I think it's just like build awesome stuff and like slowly, slowly get adoption. I think that's uh, the best way to do anything. All right. Thank you. Uh, so last question before we have to end the session because of time limit. Uh, let's go with you first, Brian. Um, can you name just quickly, can you name one thing that you jealous of actual execution and you wish you had at layer zero? And the same goes for you, Sergey. Like, can you name one thing that you're jealous of Brian's in layer zero team's execution that you, you wish you had at Axula? Interesting. Uh, one thing we're jealous of. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, so again, I, I, I think it is easy, much easier from my understanding for them to deploy uh, endpoints or, you know, basically to, to touch other chains, especially in like idiosyncratic environments. So like non-EVM chains or a bunch of other things. So I think like that, most other people, the way that they handle things, especially when you do validation, like in perspective of the other two chains, you do validation off chain from their perspective. So everything is like isolated your own chain, which kind of is this persistent environment. I think that allows like you to move very, very fast in the expansion sense of things. Uh, and I think that is nice to have for sure. Okay, so okay. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, yeah, okay, I don't know about jealous, right? I think that's, uh, you know, pretty far from my emotional state on, on most of those things. So, uh, I mean, I think, Brian, you know, they've done a pretty good job uh, doing and building kind of a developer, you know, um, or BD pipeline, right, of the if interest in projects and if interest in use cases, right? Because I think, you know, no matter what, I think, like I said, we are 
kind of a fight in the same battle of having actually interoperability being introduced in the space, right? And being introduced on a different lay level, right? Like traditionally people talked about interoperability for just moving tokens back and forth, right? And I think, you know, uh, both layer zero and Axel are trying to change the developer paradigm, right? And I think, you know, um, Layer Zero definitely has like interesting kind of a you know use cases that they demo- demonstrated right and kind of interesting um, kind of approaches around that. All right, um, and lastly, very quickly, a lot of founders, entrepreneurs, developers are looking up to both of you for inspiration, uh, and they're going to need a lot of inspiration to survive the bear market. Can you leave them some quick notes on um, what to do and inspire them to move forward? Uh, for for the rest of the season until we get to another bull cycle, maybe. All right, let's go with you first, Brian. Yeah, I mean, I I think the best advice I can possibly give is like, we, when I started this, I was building this company with like my two closest friends in the world. Like we had zero intention to build a company. We were, you know, never, ever actually like all of our rounds. We never had a pitch deck. We were never formally raising money. Like the goal wasn't to build the company. We're building something because we got like obsessed with this problem. And originally we're building it for us for like our own simple use case. We were just tinkering with. And so like, I I think as somebody who spent 20 ish years uh, building startups around technology and done a lot of like just totally, totally different uh, uh, things. um, I would say the best possible thing that you can do is just like, play with lots of things and eventually you will get like, you'll have a problem that you can't turn away from and you'll get obsessive about it. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I was basically going to retire before I did this and now I'm you know, working 80 hour weeks and my wife's just like, you know, what the heck? Um, but it was just like, you know, you, you just find something that like really captivates you um, and you're doing other stuff or you have your other job or like whatever you're doing. And you're just like, always, this is the thing you go back to, like, just go all in on that problem. Like you'll never regret that. And like, I think those are by far the conditions that lead to like most of the best things being created. I think getting obsessed about something is how all of us got into crypto in the first place. <laughs> okay. Sergey. Definitely. Yeah. I think for me, the advice would be to, you know, engage with communities, right, that are building the technology for the long term, right? Um, I think there's definitely a lot of kind of cheap marketing, right, and cheap uh, kind of, you know, um, value propositions that it seem like a quick grabs, right? Like, okay, you know, you can do this overnight or, you know, uh, get rich quickly and things like that. And I think, you know, we've seen a lot of centralized protocols and uh, solutions take advantage of that, right? So I think do your research, kind of uh, engage with teams and engage with projects that actually, you know, building the core technology that has the potential, right? That has the potential to actually change the the industry and to change the way users interact with this technology and change actual use cases, right? Um, There is no, there's not going to be a shortcut, right? Like we are going to have cycles back and forth. the the, re, the way to stay in those cycles is kind of you know surround yourself by the communities that you actually have the same the same values as you have right as you're building the technology outside of it i think there's still a lot of ways to kind of um keep going right when it when it comes to you know financial supports right so everything from grants from ecosystems right to accelerators kind of meetups and so on and so forth so you know i encourage people to kind of check out a lot of these different programs i think many ecosystems continue having them you know and that's uh potentially you know something that's worth looking if you need um you know a longer runway or anything like that Okay, uh, and I think that's it for today. Too bad we don't have more time to talk to the two of you. But thank you so much for joining us today, Sergey and Brian. And uh, we hope we can get to interview you again in the future. Uh, to the audience, thank you for joining us. Bye. Awesome. Thanks for, Thanks having, for us. having us.